my name is Amanda Fallis. I'm with the City Archives and Special Collections at the main library downtown. That's 219 Loyal <laughs> Avenue on the third floor. And we are getting ready to hear from Mrs. Stacey Pinkston. She is the executive director of the Petot House and Louisiana Landmark Society. And she is going to be giving a 225th anniversary program presentation for y'all. With that being said, um, please take it away. Again, welcome. I'm glad you're with me today. Um, as we say in the title, the Petot House, 225 years of history and legacy. Uh, it is true. It is our 225th uh, birthday this year. I'm not sure. Uh, we have a long, rich history along Bayou St. John. Actually, I have one of our docents in the audience, and the blue over here is Michael. So when it comes to questions and answers, if I don't have that answer, hopefully Michael will have the answer for us. If you're not familiar with where we are located, we are along beautiful Bayou St. John, uh, right across the street from City Park. Uh, it's a, a beautiful site. Uh, we're very happy to be there. Uh, throughout the 225 years, we have had 11 owners of the house. We'll discuss a few of those tonight. Uh, one of the main owners for many years is uh, the sisters of Cabrini. Mother Cabrini had the house for almost 60 years. Uh, we are now approaching 60 years of being the operator and caretaker of the Petod House. So we will begin. We're going to set the stage. Uh, we're going to set the stage on Bayou St. John. Uh, without Bayou St. John, really New Orleans would not have been settled so quickly as it had been. Bayou St. John was utilized as a major trade route. And actually, where the Petod House sits is one of the first European settlements of New Orleans. That bayou was essential in developing the French Quarter and thankfully to the native tribes there who helped uh, the European settlers utilize that route for trade. Uh, the two tribes, main tribes, there are several tribes in that area. The two main tribes were the Choctaw and the Chapatulas that showed the French settlers just how to utilize that route that came from Lake Pontchartrain, extended through the bayou and then down through Carondelet canal, and then into uh, the French Quarter area. So that was essential to our development uh, of New Orleans as a city. Uh, for hundred over 100 years, that area was too swampy for major development besides small encampments and things like that. But eventually, Petot House was built up there. They did start draining that, that area. So there was a, a, a more of a suitable foundation for, for development. 1799, Bartholomew Bosk was the first to develop uh, the Petot House. Uh, and I think I mentioned there, 1855, Esplanade Avenue was built. And then more development happened. Um, the route ended in 1936. Congress then decided that that would no longer be a navigational trade route. Most of the owners of the Petot House uh, were merchants, which made sense. We're going to first talk about a little bit about the architectural style of the house. Uh, it is very unique. Uh, it is a West Indies style house. It is a, a climate, hot, humid weather type of house, very much similar to the Caribbean houses, West Indies style houses. It works very well for this climate here in New Orleans. It is a mix of styles. It is um, many different influences, just like New Orleans is. French colonial, West Indies, Creole country house. It looks much larger than it is. From the inside, it's a very small little house. Uh, really, the most of the living space was on the second floor. The first floor, especially the first uh, few years of the house, was basically for utility, storage, things like that, because there was still a risk at that time early on for flooding. So it was just for like supplies. And later on, it did get developed and they started utilizing the uh, first floor for living space as well. What is interesting about the style is it's three rooms, top and bottom, three main rooms, and then flanked on the sides are smaller rooms like cabinets. And those cabinets could be utilized for anything from bedrooms for the kids. It could be uh, storage. It could be an office. Um, we currently have one look interpreted as an office right now. You know, if there were merchants there, more than likely they had a business office. Uh, we are looking to utilize an, another one as a children's bedroom and interpreting that someday, hopefully soon. Something interesting about uh, Creole style architecture is that there's no main entrance. There's no, like we have now, we have a main, you know, front door, there's a foyer, you know where to enter in. And, and here it's anyone's guests. And we have a lot of guests roaming around in the gardens, wanting, you know, trying to figure out how to get in. And we probably should be a little clearer 
you know, on, on where our different rooms are over here at the way end is where our little office is, uh, the Louisiana Landmark Society and, and I and my staff or Grace um, operate out of the house. We have a bookstore and then we have some, some other um, common rooms, but um, yes, you don't know where to enter, but that's a Creole style of the house. Uh, anywhere you're welcome, uh, how you enter into the house. Uh, but back in the day, they would come in from the back of the house is how they would enter in their coach and buggy, but guests would enter in from the front. And I think here I should mention that we are one of the only three West Indies style houses left in Louisiana. We're the only ones open to the public. So I mentioned that we were a warm weather climate home. So I took this photo. This is our back a loja, loja is just a fancy French word for back porch. When you're entering up into the uh, second floor, you're coming up the steps over here and it shows, this is where the gallery is, front gallery, and it shows this cross ventilation coming in uh, from the door. So the, all the doors are parallel to each other. So before air conditioning, I am sure all those doors were flung open and those bayou breezes are real. They are a real thing that happened. And I'm sure that's one of the reasons why some of these Bartholomew Bosque and the others decided to come up to that area is because it was cooler along the bayou than say being in the smelly, stuffy French Quarter. Um, and I remember last July, I haven't been with the organization long, and last July, I wanted to throw a Bastille Day party. And my board was like, are you kidding? It's July and August. I'm a former Northerner from Chicago. And they're like, no one's gonna come. It's 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 really, it's hot in July. And I had lived here previously, so I knew what it was gonna be like, but I'm like, I don't know. Like we we really get some good breezes over there. And we we ended up hosting the event. We had over 130 people and, and it was a true thing. Like a lot of, and they were just like, you're right, like people showed up and the breezes were a real thing. So so the breezes are real, it's it's beautiful there, but also who constructed this house, they think his last name was Booty. He was probably like more of a general contractor, I wouldn't call him an architect at that time, but they knew what they were doing. They knew how to build that house for what, you know, for living and in these hot climates. They have the high ceilings up here, the wide porches, uh, which are going to protect from the hot sun, the breezes coming in. Uh, also, it's very interesting, you can't see here, but our flooring, you'll have to come up and see, but I love our floors. $17.99, these very wide boards, they are made out of heart of pine, which is just uh, the center of the pine tree, the best, the best part of the pine tree. And in there's little slots in between these boards, and those are on purpose for ventilation to come up. Like houses have to breathe, everything has to breathe. And so it's like a little bit of HVAC, you know, naturally the, the, everything has to come up. So Barth Bartholomew Bosque was the developer of the property. He at the time had a beautiful home at 619 Charter Street. I don't know if anyone's been to the Flirty Girl uh, down in the uh, quarter, but that was Bartholomew Bosque's house at the time. He decided he wanted a country home. So he developed the property for the Petot house. Uh, he never lived in it, though. He just developed the property. He started building it there. He was a merchant ship owner, very prominent in New Orleans. And this is a, um, a cast of a lion head, which is a uh, nod to Spain because of his Spanish heritage. So it's on our fireplace in the parlor up there. Also, there's little, there's like an eyeglass. There's like a anchor, things that are a nod to his merchant and shipping business and, and industry. He then sold the house. He had the house pretty much done, and he, but he never lived in it. Then he sold it to his neighbor, Joseph Renz, uh, who had it very briefly, but also never lived in it. Now, the third owner to take the house was Madame Marie Ryu. She was a widower of Vincent Ryu, who was a big property owner, real estate person in the French Quarter. Her claim to fame later on was she was also soon to be Edgar Degas' great grandmother. But she ended up inheriting a lot of her husband's holdings in the French Quarter. And from what I hear, was quite ruthless, cutthroat, a uh, real estate lady. And, and that's pretty incredible for, for that early 1800s. Uh, sounds like she was a very strong woman, strong-willed, strong personality. So she purchased the house, she's a third owner, and she's attributed to doing a lot of the enclosures on the bottom floor, making that more of a, um, of a living space. 
she's attributed to putting in the fireplace. You know, we have a little, we have more of like a utility dining room table in there. Uh, this is also our cake room. We do have weddings there. They like to cut the cake in that room. She also is credited to possibly uh, putting on the South Gallery to the Petot House as well. But she pretty much finished the house as we see it now. And then she sold it to James Francis Petot. Now, people are always like, Pito, Petot, Potato, Potato is what I say because both are correct. Uh, before he arrived in uh, America, he emigrated through France to Philadelphia. And when he arrived in Philadelphia, he was Jacques-Francois Pitot. And he anglicized his name and became James Francis Pitot. Uh, there are a lot of Pitot descendants still in the area. We have some traveling um, come from all over, uh, actually, the United States and come and, and do a little pilgrimage. Oh, you're, you're Pitot. Okay. All right. Uh, and and who's, what's your lineage? Her mother was, it's my great grandma was a Pitot. Your great grandma was a Pitot. Okay. Well, wonderful. And and if I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on anything that you're hearing. Well, here. He knows all of this. Oh, he does. Okay. He needs to come over and see us. Are you local here? Yes. Okay. Well, wonderful. Welcome. Uh, so James Pitot uh, was an importer, exporter, coffee and wine, among other things. He became very wealthy when he was living in Saint-Domingue, Saint which is now Haiti. Uh, when the revolution hit there, then that's when he came to America and then found his way uh, actually through the bayou to New Orleans. So he came the route through the bayou to New Orleans, which is kind of interesting. And he, you know, bought the house, uh, brought his family to uh, the Petot house. Uh, we name it after the Petot, after James Petot, because going through uh, all the owners, we felt he was the most prominent uh, of the owners of the house. He was our first U.S. mayor of New Orleans, uh, 1804, 1805, after Louisiana purchased, you know, only any for a year, so was not corrupt, uh, did a lot of great things like established first city council, a lot of city departments, including the police department. As well, he was a big advocate for the New Orleans Public Library, which is, you know, a nice little dovetail into this program tonight. Uh, he was also president of the New Orleans Navigational Company. During the War of 1812, it, that really hurt his merchant business. He then became, uh, and then kind of was financially strained. I'm not quite sure if the bank then took the house, but he was allowed to continue to live in the house through 1819. He then became a parish judge until his death of 1831 at age 16. So he was in the house from 1810 to 1819. We interpret it or try to interpret it to that time period. We're actually the last tie to that bayou heritage and culture, the Petot House is. So we really try to keep, you know, the majority of the antiques, the Louisiana American antiques we have in the house or around that time period, the early 1800s. We may have a few things that venture into the 30s or 40s, but we try to keep that, you know, kind of colonial aesthetic into the house. It's very important to us. And also when we have children visiting too, that they learn a little bit about what, uh, about what they, you know, what that was like at that time. You know, we show them the first refrigeration, which is a huge, big, like stone olive jar that they have to put all their perishables in and then bury it, you know, compared to what conveniences we have now. I think it's nice to show them, you know, what, uh, you know, the colonial times were like here in New Orleans. He had two wives and unfortunately one wife, uh, Marie Jean, Jean, she perished in the house. She died in the house during childbirth. She was giving birth to two twin girls and both did not make it through infancy and she died during childbirth. He then, then remarried pretty soon after within the next year to Genevieve Pitot. And uh, then they had, I believe, two more children after that. And he ended up, after living in the Petot house, they moved to the French Quarter, and, and that's where he ended up staying until his death. Another owner, after James Petot, uh, then Albin Michel bought the house. Uh, he was a French council general. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about uh, his family, but he lived in the house. He actually died in the Petot house. His son ended up taking over the Petot house. And they were one of the longest uh, families to own the house from 1819 to 1848. The next owner after that was Felix Duquier. Uh, actually, Duquier's, Felix's great-great-grandson was just at the Petot House last week. They were in town from Clor uh, Florida. Their granddaughter goes to Tulane. So they came over the house. And, and this happens all the time. And it's wonderful that we're, we're constantly greeting descendants of 
uh, owners and, and residents of uh, the Petot House. There's like a little pilgrimage. They make it their stop when they're in town, which is really nice. And, you know, we had a good conversation and they're going to send me some uh, documents they had of Felix's time at the Petot House because we're always learning about this history. Um, and there's always, you know, contradictions. Uh, added the dormers at the top. Also, you can tell oh, yes, probably at that time adding just some modern features or in, you know, in vogue yeah. with, with the fashion. Another family in the house was the Joseph Steckler family, and uh, he had the Steckler Seed Company. Uh, this is a um, family photo that is hanging in our house. Uh, he did really have six kids in that house, and you've been up at the Petot house. It's it's small quarters up there, the second floor. It was only two beds. Uh, so those porches were used for sleeping porches. I'm sure the kids were sleeping out on the porches. Um, and what's interesting about this image, and you can see it at the house, this son actually over his father's shoulder is deceased. And the photographer, even at that time, was able to superimpose that child into the photo. This is like the first Photoshop. I mean, he didn't know what he was even inventing at that time. So that original photo is at the house hanging in the parlor. But that's pretty amazing uh, because, I mean, they wanted him to be included in, in the family photo. They had the house from 1899 to 1904. They ended up so selling uh, the house to Mother Cabrini. Mother Cabrini. Um, Mother Cabrini arrived in New Orleans around 1891. She was called here due to the prominent clergy in town, due to the hate, the awful crimes that were happening to Italian immigrants here. Uh, they actually, she was responding to a really awful incident where 11 Italian men were hung due to them falsely being accused of killing a police officer. And so she came down here with a few of her sisters to see what was going on here, saw how awful the conditions were, like she did everywhere. I mean, she did this in Italy, she did this in New York, she did this in Chicago, saw how awful the conditions were here for Italian immigrants and ended up staying here and building orphanages and schools and trying to get the Italian immigrants through some of these, um, you know, plagues and, and ec epidemics of yellow fever and the like. So she saw that her need was here and she stayed. The sisters uh, purchased the Petot house in 1904. Uh, you know, I, we are in touch quite often with um, the Karini High School next door. And I hear it only really touched on her New York, uh, her time in New York. It really didn't get to other cities like her time in New Orleans or, or um, Chicago or any other American cities. So the uh, sisters Cabrini were flourishing with their work, with the orphanages, with the schools and, and the girls' school to be the school girls school was um, really they're running out of room out of space and they wanted to demolish the Petot house and actually the next door Tisot house uh, for their new high school. Uh, at the time, uh, the president of Louisiana Landmark Society was uh, Harnett T. Kane. Uh, we currently have we, we have a ward named after Harnett T. Kane that we give out every year in his honor. He led negotiations with the sisters and the city of New Orleans to take the Petot house from them and relocate it 220 feet over to where we are currently. We also wanted to save the Tisot house, but there's only so many funds for only so many houses. And what do you do with another, you know, you have to kind of pick, you know, between your children, unfortunately. And I felt, I think they felt that the Petot house had a richer history and was richer in architectural style um, for savings. So uh, the Louisiana Landmark Society, if you're not familiar with us, we are a preservation advocacy organization here uh, in New Orleans. Um, that's my other job. Uh, we monitor what's going on in the city with landmarks and, and buildings, and we have a New Orleans nine most endangered list to call attention to, to buildings like the Petot House, which was languishing and also um, close to demolition. So he helped raise $10,000 at that time to move the house 220 feet. And from what I, I have read, that's about $100,000 nowadays to move it because they wanted that site. The sisters wanted that exact site for their high school where it was. So, and there was playground. We're, we're kind of on the Desmere playground area. And so they brokered a, a, a deal that we would have a corner of that site uh, but yes, they wanted that exact site. And so they demolished the Tisot house to also give them more room on the other side uh, of the bayou. 
And um, so, yes, he worked to raise the funds so we could move the house. It was a big deal. It all moved over here in a day. Uh, and we also decided that it was going to go back to the original look of the house. And this is based on a sketch by Charles Alexandre Lussor of 1830s. He was a well-known French artist. And uh, so that's what we took the house back to. And the restoration architects were Koch and Wilson, Koch and Wilson. Um, so here is the Pitot house. And it looks so different, right? Like, look at this, you know, because they, they enclose all that porch area. It doesn't even look like the Pitot house. So this is a whole second floor on the back of a truck moving over. And uh, unfortunately, they could, not, uh, they could not save the first floor. And um, most, of these, most of these original brick colonnades, Tuscan order colonnades were um, salvaged. Uh, there are two that, that did not make it over and they were recreated. And you know what? Come over and, and, and see if you can show me which ones are real and which are fake, because I cannot tell. Uh, these are wood. These are made out of wood, but these are, are brick. So it, it arrives in its new site, and it's not even there a year. And then Hurricane Betsy comes along and blows off our roof, which set us back <laughs> a little bit. And uh, all in all, I think it took almost nine years for the restoration, the recreation uh, to happen at the new site. Uh, and the new site is very interesting as well in its heritage. Uh, it was where uh, Trivoli was, an amusement park was. And back in the heyday, that had dances and, you know, um, amusement park and all different kinds of things. And it was a really community kind of get together, I, I think even on Sunday nights. And everyone was welcome there. Everyone was welcome to join the party. Um, and that's where the, the site is of our current Pitot house. In 1971, we were added to the National Register of Historic Places. In 1974, we erected the sign along the bayou, and it's, it's just directly across from us. Some of you may have seen it over there. On October 21st, 1973, that's when we officially opened as the Petot House Museum. That is a special invitation, and it seems to be very VIP because you had to pre please present this card. So they didn't want anyone that wasn't invited to come to this uh, opening. Back to the market dedication, they had a big event that day, and they also, I, I saw photos of them, uh, and I should have put them in there. They had they had gentlemen dressed up in, like, cavalry, and they were shooting muskets off of, of the gallery. I should have put that in there, but it was kind of fun. So they had a, a fun party uh, with a, mar a marker dedication. And one thing that came over, well, in design anyway, and was recreated was the Parterre Garden. The Parterre Garden was originally there at the Pitot original site, and that carried through in design over to our house. Actually, that is recent. I just recently took that from the second, um, or from the upper gallery. The Parterre Gardens were, you know, something that developed in France in the 15th century. And uh, it was to be like visually stunning to people, Geom you know, with geometry, uh, visual impact, and it was designed to be a showstopper. You know, back in the day, just like now, you know, that's a sign of success. You know, the big garden, the beautiful design, that's a sign of wealth, success. And so and I want to say, was it the Stecklers that had the first garden? I want to say he maybe had the first garden design or, or was under them flourishing. Um, a little bit of movie trivia, if you don't know, uh, we have our own little movie trivia. That is our parlor upstairs. Uh, Interview with a Vampire with Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise was filmed there in 1994. Uh, it's the scene where Kristen Dunst is on the couch. I think she's 10. I don't know. She's very young at that time, nine, eight. And um, when I first came on um, as the executive director, you know, I had to rewatch the film because I'm like, I, I have to find out that part. And it, it took, you know, back and forth and back and forth. And, and the clue was we have these great louvered shutters on, on the back uh, loggia. And you can see a glimpse of those very quickly. I mean, that scene happens. It's like three seconds. Uh, but it, we are in there. The Petot house is in there. And this was something the film crew added, this flower motif that is above the, the fireplace. And we kept that as kind of like our history of the Petot.
Uh, one of our only items we have of the Petot family is uh, of Sophie Petot portrait uh, that hangs in one of the, the master bedrooms. It was painted by portrait artist Jacques Armand, a Flemish painting who emigrated from France uh, and actually was very successful here. He did Andrew Jackson's portrait of the anniversary, 25th anniversary of the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, he was also very entrepreneurial. Like I think he wrote Andrew Jackson a letter and asked him if he could paint his portrait. Like unlike most artists, they're, they're, they're not as entrepreneurial in spirit. They're not as aggressive and he seemed to be very aggressive, um, but he was also very talented. He did uh, a lot of portraits. And if you're at historic New Orleans collection, if you're at Herman Grimma, some of the other house museums, you're going to see some of uh, Jacques Roman's work. Uh, he's very well known, very talented person. Uh, they believe he went to Beaux-Arts in Paris, but that has not been officially documented. A story that I read was in order to escape the yellow fever ep epidemic going on in the French Quarter, he found himself a cushy gig out at Homa's house and stayed out there and painted all their portraits, kind of like buying some time, you know, away from the quarter. So he was very entrepreneurial. Uh, this portrait is her debutante ball portrait. Uh, still in, from what I hear, the, the coloring that they do still of the debutante ball, the white with the blue sash. Um, she is shown without jewelry in this portrait, which is rare. Usually if you come into the home at that time and a woman's portrait is on the wall, you're going to see her best jewels. You're going to see her best dress. This probably was her best dress at the time, but uh, women were not allowed, unmarried women at that time were not allowed to wear jewelry. So that is why she has not shown any jewelry on her. Uh, she is just 16 um, at that time. Another uh, favorite of, of the collection we have is in the other bedroom, and that is the butterfly bed. Uh, that is a Fairfax bed, 1810, very appropriate for the time of the house. Uh, that is loaned from us from a, a member of the Herman Grimma family. And uh, how many of you are familiar with the butterfly man or the story of the butterfly man? If you, you are. Um, it's a it's a very interesting story. There's a, a book on it, Chasing the Butterfly Man. Uh, this is a furniture maker who's mostly known for his uh, armoires. And he developed this type of joint they called the butterfly joint, a joinery system in the armoire, which then became pretty much um, a formality in all armoires. And I this is a rare bed of the same um Butterfly Man, they call him. Uh, they believe his name is George Dewhurst, but that is, again, speculation. They believe it is him because he was known for this really intricate and beautiful inlay he did on not only his uh, armoires, but he, I mean, you can see, like, this is on our bed here. I mean, they are so, like, look at this beautiful ribbon here. It's one and the same, uh, these beautiful little bows, our furniture design. Um, our music, everything. And uh, so we're not quite sure if Apprentice made this bed, you know, and maybe he did the inlay, you know, so much unknown, but we're very happy to have that as part of our collection. It's, it's, an, it's a really nice piece. So I hope you, you'll come by and see that. A next piece I really enjoy at the house and I love showing off is this 18th century George Mahogany travel desk. Uh, this is like the first laptop. You know, they would they would take this, they would put it on top of their luggage, they would get into their coach, and then they could, it was like a lap desk, they could fold it out, it had a little bit, it has a little bit of slant to it, they, you, you can open it up and you put your important papers on the bottom, you've got your little wax stamps at the top and you can write your important, important business letters, or maybe you're white, uh, writing the wife back home. Uh, and then maybe putting the, the papers back in under uh, under the cover and, and closing it. But it's a really neat piece. Uh, I really like showing it off. This is um, a cabinet that we interpret currently as a desk. There were a lot of merchants, as I mentioned. I'm sure a lot of business and trade was going on in the house. So we have that in there. It's a nice little piece. So going forward to where we are now, um, we're always doing things to enhance uh, the site we're at. Uh, we are currently, a, or just as recently this past year, a Louisiana certified native garden. Uh, we are a bronze level, which means 60% of the plants we have on site are native to Louisiana. We'd like to increase that 
um, and and go up to silver or, or you know gold level eventually. But as you probably know, native plants are, are easier to take care of because they are for this climate. You know, they can withstand the heat, they can withstand the flooding. So we hope to keep growing in that direction and having more native plants uh, on our site. Currently, we're getting ready to start a major restoration of the upper gallery. If you can kind of see here, we have some structural issues going on on the second floor of the gallery. We have some rotting members on, on the second floor. Um, so this is gonna be starting anytime now. Uh, we um, started an ambitious campaign end of November. We did very well with, with fundraising, I must say, and, um, and thankful to, to two big foundations here, but there's a lot of people that have written some nice um, donations for this. Uh, Rosa Mary Foundation and LOS Freeman are two of the big funders. Of course, have, have some work to do. Um, we are going to keep with this um, exterior maintenance in uh, historically correct with the 1830s sketch that you saw. We're not going to make any kind of, of changes. Uh, and we also need a, a, a nice exterior painting, overall painting. When I first arrived at the position, my first question, I think, even in the interview was like, when's the last time we've painted the Petot house? So, so we are going to get in showpiece form for our um, birthday party in October. Something new that we have recently added uh, to the back patio area is a vegetable garden. I know James Petot had a vegetable garden. Many of them had a vegetable garden. So we're kind of getting back to that heritage of having a vegetable garden. Uh, these are some of the things we've planted. Uh, see, we have that, that's recent, that, that ripe tomato is ready for the picking and I probably better get it. Some of you may be over there. Uh, we have tomatoes, eggplant, okra, strawberries, pole beans, and Tabasco peppers. Uh, we'd like to thank the Nola Town Gardeners um, and also um, the Norlands Garden Club. They provide us with support each year through grants to help us take care of the site and the plantings. And, uh, you know, we're a small site and it's, it takes a lot. It takes a village. It really does to maintain that, to plant that, to weed that. And also want to thank my volunteers if any of them are listening. Uh, one thing new this year, we uh, planted uh, some beautiful tropical milkweed all along the fence. Tons of plants and uh, we were very prosperous and, and we attracted uh, the right crowd. We attracted a bunch of monarch butterflies and they're all over now at the Petot House. So we're a little bit of a nature con uh, conservancy over there, um, but that's been a lot of fun and that's one thing that was important to us as well. And we're, you know, just opening the, up the house for a lot of different activities. You know, our whole thought is, our whole thought process is trying to get people over and enjoying activities so they can enjoy the site how they like to enjoy the site. We just did this last week, uh, the day before Mother's Day. We had 16 women uh, at a class led by D of the Nola Town Gardeners creating floral centerpieces. Uh, we've also have done a bourbon and cheese event. We have done yoga on the lawn. Uh, we're always open for, for um, tours, of course, but we're just trying different things to get more people over. Uh, I would like us to be just a, you know, known in the community of like, hey, what is going on at the Petot House? You know, let's stop over. Let's walk over and see what they have going on. Um, and that's how you keep a historic house operating, running. You've got to have people. You've got to have activity. You've got to make sure that, you know, we have such a great location on the bayou. Um, it's quite surprising, I'm sure Michael will say as well, the amount of tourists from all over the world that, that are stopping at the Petot House. And I haven't really even had a budget yet to do any kind of marketing. And I'm always like, how did you find us? Google, you know, they Google historic homes in New Orleans and lucky, luckily we're popping up uh, at, at the top and, or they're over at City Park and they just wander along the bayou and they find us and stop. But um, I mean, I remember around the Christmas holiday, I mean, I think just in one day or that weekend, that week we had New Zealand and Denmark and we had South Africa and we had uh, Italy. Like it was amazing the, you know, the, the tourists from all over the world that stop at the Petot because I feel kind of we're a hidden gem. I mean, I know a lot of locals that are like, I've yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm like, well, stop, stop and come over and see us. So we're always looking to do more things. Coming up, we're having a Bastille Day kickoff. Uh, back to our French heritage. That'll be July 11th. That's going to be a Thursday evening. Uh, we'll have French wines. We're going to have a band called Pardon My French. 
plane, uh, depending on where we are in the restoration, they may or may not be on the upper gallery. Uh, we have Cafe de Gas, who's going to be our food vendor, but that'll be a fun evening. And I'm serious, those Bayou Breezes, they do happen, come over and see us. And then also we're having our big 225th birthday party, our FET in October, October 27th. Uh, five to eight, we'll be having our big fed, our big celebration. And um, I'm hopeful that we will be, you know, done with our restoration. We'll have a freshly painted Petot house to celebrate our 225th birthday. And that's all I have for tonight. And and if anyone has any questions or any stories that they know about the house. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Stacy. I just want to give you a quick thank you. Um, I also want to set it up for folks at home. If you uh, have any questions, just put them in the chat. And I will relay them to Stacy. Quick question: Was the house almost? Do you feel that it was always white? Do you have any sense that it was ever? I I have seen some reference in some documents that that white was the color for the heat, and also sometimes they mixed a little lime in in the mixture of the paint because that would keep away the insects. So from what we know, yes. Um, and also I read the colors on the interior. I don't know if you, you saw a little flash of them here and there. Those are uh, typical Creole colors, but I did read uh, from an interpretation, I don't know, 25 years ago that there was photo, there was photo analysis done, color analysis done on the walls. So we are pretty appropriate with, with the colors that are, are in the house. Um, if you have a question, what about the bathrooms? Were they added later? The bath we we have modern yes we have modern facilities uh, they were added and and they're kind of tucked behind uh, the three main rooms on the first floor and and I think whoever did that addition I don't know if it was Coke and Wilson uh, Coke and Wilson are doing our also our new restoration but they were nicely done that that um, you can't really find them you know they they blend in don't they blend in nicely Michael. Okay, my question is the house that was next door that was torn down. The tea thought, yeah. What was what did you find special about that that you like to see though? You know, I, I don't know much about the Tsot house. I, I'm still learning about the Petot house. I do not know, unfortunately. I do know the Tsots were, the family was an owner of the Petot house for a while. And then I believe they, they did they build the Tsot house? I think it was a later it was a later house. It was later than, than the Petot house, but I believe the family, the Tsot family, did live in the Petot house for a while. I did not mention them, but then they moved next door, right, to, to the Tsot house or built, yeah, built that house next door. But I, I do not know. I think they were similar in style, though, because that's that's what the style was of the architecture. Sure. Kitchen, kitchen, kitchen or separate buildings, yes, and I should have mentioned that. Um, there are articles when um, James Petot was there and also, uh, that's one thing that Madame Ryu did when she was the third owner, built off-site kitchen. Uh, there were, yes, slave quarters, and I did not mention that, but there were domestic servants for a house that size, about six. Uh, they did everything from, of course, you know, took care of the chickens to the children, uh, made dinner. Um, you know, there wasn't really any type of industry. You know, there were 30 acres that originally the Petot house sat on, but I think probably the biggest industry was, you know, that farm that, Duquier had, that's probably the biggest industry they had there, but they had, you know, they had chickens and cows and, and for their purpose, they had vegetables for their purpose. They may had an orchard for their purpose. Mostly they weren't, you know, really selling unless it was, you know, like uh, farm animals, you know, the Duquier is so. Yes. When you say domestic servants, are you talking about enslaved people? Yes, yes. Um, higher names like Irish. Uh, I, I don't know. Peter had to leave the Tory, and there were seven adult enslaved people with three kids. Was that during the Petot era? Yeah. Okay. It was seven. I thought I saw six. Yeah. Okay. That's done in uh, 1812 or 1814. Yeah. You know, but they they were domestic, yes. And I would like us to, you know, do more and and interpret more of what their time was like, but we're not finding a whole lot of information except names and and ages, yeah, we don't have stories or anything of their times. So we would have to look and see right where they came from. I don't know. Did you see any of that? Like where were they? Because um, the article I or, or the documentation I read on the Petots talked about what they brought up from the French Quarter residents to the country home. And the slaves were included in that, you know, kind of like inventory, unfortunately, you know, and that's all, you know, so I don't know her origins, but you're right. I, I mean, we should be able to get that documentation from somewhere, from some. 
from some source. Right. Say Creole or say Sanamé. If they're from Africa, we'll say a country or a tribe. We'll have to look for that. Yeah, well. In French, and what we have is, you know, been translated. Oh, okay. And it's a thing. Who was the quote? Who was watching? I don't know. Did you see that? I, I didn't. We didn't see occupations or what their what their role were. Belongings. Right. It was. It was. Yeah. Listed like belongings. When someone dies, a list, a full list. Right. Yeah. yeah. But given that they live in San Francisco, we'll have to look. Spanish. We will have to see if we can dig deeper somewhere. And the bear review, Freeman told an inventor, who was up in France, is also the center. He, he, he is. He. Uh, uh, the what, second person? Yes. He, he revolutionized the, the sugar industry, yes. And I should have mentioned him, yes. Rearming houses like Pito. I know there was one down the street here in Dumaine. I, I guess it's not really. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's similar. It's. It's similar. Yeah, I don't know the third. I don't know the third. Uh, uh, similar to this style is the customs house down the street. Uh, it's a private home. It's not open. Uh, and I'm not sure the third one. I just know that that. Yes, um, where? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it, it, that's close. I would say that's close. Well, it's skinny. It's not Madam Jones. That's the second. Which one would be the third? Well, there's, 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 there's something similar to a custom house down, down the street. It's, it's older actually than the pizza house, but it's not open. Um, it is a private home. Yeah. Yeah, it's it just predates Petot by a few years, about five 1794 years. Seventeen ninety four custom. Okay. Does anybody know whether there was uh, wooden boards used at the Pitu house um, that came from plow boats or field boats because it was right along the. Oh, yeah, that's that's a good question. I I, I don't know, but but if you see the original the, the original floors on the second floor, I mean they're they're very wide. They're they're very wide, uh, but they do look like. You know, when I did do some research on, like, it was it was the most popular uh, flooring material at the time was pine, and they, you, they show the big, large boards. It looks very much like our boards. I don't think anything was utilized, but that would have made sense, right? Yeah. Any other questions? Do we have any additional questions at home? Please type it in the chat. And then also, we do have the house usually open on, on any of those uh, events. So we'll have a docent up there. If you haven't been up in a while, I welcome you to come over. You're welcome anytime. We're open Wednesday through Friday, 10 to 3. Uh, if that doesn't work for you, email me, you know, and, and we can arrange a time. Come on over and, and see our house. Excellent. Yes. Thank you so much, Stacy. Please, a round of applause. This was very educational. I learned a lot. <laughs> did, did I, well, I should have asked Michael, did I forget anything? Is there anything that they should know? that they didn't get in the presentation. I was a little nervous Michael is sitting in. Uh, I should say that without our docents giving the tours, our volunteer docents, uh, the PTOT would not be able to operate. You know, But not only do they do tours, they help out with inventory, they're organizing, they're cleaning. And I think Michael just volunteered to put together my new um, lectern as well, my new podium. So they, they get themselves in all kinds of projects. But thank you all for coming. Uh, please stop by and see us if you haven't seen us in a while. We welcome you over. I uh, would love to show you some of the new things and, and see the butterflies. They're really beautiful. Thank you again. Okay, nice, nice to see you. Thank you all very much. Yes, follow us on nolacityarchives.org and um, we will have a post. Keep an eye on our blog.